So uh, thank you for coming to today. It's the third installment of my Lei Qing um, histories uh, lecture series. Uh, again, the first one is the first Opium War, and then the second Opium War. And today we're going to talk about the Taiping Rebellion. Now, Taiping Rebe Rebellion is it's a very interesting thing. It um, has the highest casualties of any human conflict in human history. Uh, one of the estimates have it that this conflict, which is uh, basically rebellion from a bunch of um, farmers from southern China caused uh, against the Qing uh, government, uh, caused at least 70 million deaths. You know what, 70 million, that is, that we're in Hong Kong, so it's, it's basically 10 Hong Kongs. So if you think of Hong Kong, like, if, let's say, even if Hong Kong people were cats and you have nine lives, would still all be dead because 10 times Hong Kong. And then another estimate is headed that uh, Chinese population actually went down by 25% from 4.3, um, that's 430 million to about 320. So we're talking about huge numbers here. And what is very interesting is that this is a, a, a regime that is the first time in Chinese history where this, but this regime was founded upon European principles. And that is the Taiping Rebellion, the head of the Taiping Rebellion, Hong, Hong Xiuquan, we call him Hong, um, believed that he was the second son of God. And therefore, they were in this kind of pseudo-Christian slash cultish um, regime, um, the, the theocracy, you could say. And so that, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's really the, f the first, if we talk about Lei Qing, why is Lei Qing so interesting? It's because it is the first time when European civilization clashes with Chinese civilization. And the Taiping Rebellion is both a very... Uh, run of the mill, very like, uh, like like a farmer, uh, the peasant revolt that had happened for the past two thousand years is it's, it's very standard. A lot of things are very standard, but at the same time, it has a lot of influence uh, from European culture and Christian culture. So today, we'll bring you to uh, the world Taiping Tianguo. It's got, they call it the Taiping Tianguo. What is Taiping? The Taiping means peace. Tianguo means heaven, but in fact, this is actually just a warring hell. So. So in the beginning, we talk about the background. So uh, let's go back. First Opium War was between 1839 to 1842. And, and so, and, and it actually, has, this rebellion has direct relationship with, uh, from, the, from the Treaty of Nanjing, which is signed between the British and the Chinese, and, and the Qing, uh, because of one of these terms. One of the terms is actually that, if, if you remember, before the Opium War, all the trading that's to be done between China and European nations were through um, Guangzhou, Canton. And so, let's say for example, uh, because the British liked tea the most. Where is tea most commonly manufactured or, or harvested in China? It's in Fujian, which is here. But you can't, but, but you can't go through Fujian to go to, uh, to, go to England. So what, you, what happened was that the tea would be transported down to Canton and from Canton to, um, to England. So everything, so that created a huge industry of basically freight, of, uh, of, of moving goods from, let's say, silk from like the Shanghai area to Canton, tea from uh, uh, the, the Xiamen, uh, the, uh, Fujian area to, to Canton. But then with the, one, of the, uh, one of the terms in the uh, First Opium War is that, in the Treaty of Nanjing, is that the five ports are opened uh, with Canton, we have Xiamen, which is right opposite to Taiwan, Fujian, uh, Ningbo, and Shanghai. So what we had here, what we have here now is that, let's say for example, the silk can go straight to Shanghai or Ningbo and go straight to uh, go straight to Europe, or the tea can go straight from Xiamen straight to Europe. So what happened was it killed a lot of jobs for very very well able young men around this area. So if you, uh, this is one of very interesting background. All the triads that you see in movies, like that's like you watch in America, uh, like the, the, that's what Hong Kong movie is really famous for, right? All triads actually came from a, just one sect. It's it's basically an uh, anti-Qing uh, rebellion group. All of the triads came from that uh, secret society. Triad means three, right? The three is actually heaven, earth, and human. It has this pseudo um, religious uh, connotation to it, and then but and most of these triads actually were active in the transportation industry. 
because uh, because you think about it like you know mutiny or bounty or like you know rebel without a cause. It's always about like you know traveling or ports, and that's that's how most of the triads have, have, um, have organized themselves. Now you've got all these people who are organizing in terms of doing all the transportation, the tea and the silk. They all went unemployed, and so it's the crisis brewing. Another crisis economically, why southern China was so unstable at the time, was because the, um, if you remember, the uh, uh, Treaty of Nanjing is uh, China had to pay silver, uh, 21 million um, uh, silver dollars to Britain. And also opium is dragging a lot of uh, silver away from China. And also last time, I talked about the first time where the um, where during that period, most of the silver was actually uh, harvested, was actually mined in Mexico and in Colombia and in Peru. And these three countries were going through the war of independence with Spain. So the uh, silver production plummeted. And so there was a huge silver shortage around the world. And in, in that case, the, the Chinese peasants, the, the, how the economics worked was that they would uh, you know, harvest their, 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 their produce and then they would sell it for copper, copper coins. But then all taxation is actually done in silver. So when the supply of silver comes down, the price of silver versus copper goes up. So in effect, it's a huge tax increase for peasants. So a huge uh, economic burden for, um, for the peasants. So basically one of the catalysts of this is angry young men. Angry, angry young unemployed man. So when you become, so there's this new study that shows that couples fight a lot more when they're going on a diet together. So because, because you, know, when you, you get angry when you're hungry. And so, and so th that's why they say it's like, it's, uh, let's say for example, Spain or Portugal or Greece these days, you've got young 25 year old guys, unemployment is about 40%. And so there's always something brewing. And then another reason it's because uh, uh, the markets were actually opened to, to Europe, especially Britain. And Britain had already gone through the Industrial Revolution. And so, for example, cloth in China before uh, the British came was actually, uh, there's a term in Chinese which is men go farming, women go knitting, right? Knitting, right? And so, but now you've got, you've got suddenly you've got these big Manchester uh, factory made cloth against like a pair of hands, right? And obviously there's this huge demand that got shifted towards the manufactured goods. And so you've, it's, it basically, it's a huge collapse of the uh, single, you know, handmade industry in China. And so another thing is also population growth. And wasn't a lot of the raw material for the cloth coming from India? Yes. Which is what was helping also fuel the opium. Yes, trade. so it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's thanks to the British, everything get, you know, like shifted around. So angry young men, hungry, and also population, huge population uh, pressure. If you look at it, at, at 1700, uh, the Chinese population is around 100 to 120 million. By the end of Qianlong's reign, which is about se uh, 1796, we're talking about uh, 300 million. By this point in 1850, which is the beginning of Taiping Rebellion, Chinese population went up to like 430 million, which is, you know, that. So in some sense, every single time China, why China's uh, uh, dynasties last about 200 years is because the first 100 years is about population growth. And then it, 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 everybody becomes, uh, the population density becomes too, too high, and so they kill each other off. So if you look at it from a very macro level, it's just a very animal kingdom biological thing. And so all of these factors, population, um, silver, and um, the, the, the collapse of industry, all contribute to a, a huge um, political economic pressure in southern China. And then... So what happened is, now we go into the, uh, the story, and, and that is uh, the person himself, you know, the Taiping, this heaven. The founder is a guy called Hong Xiaoquan, Hong. And he is, um, it, 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 he's a group of people called the Hakka, you know, the, the, the Hakka, where they, they're, a lot of them are actually in southern China as well, and, and, and Southeast Asia as well. And the Hakka, Hakka basically means guests. So because uh, they basically all came from um, northern China, down to southern China, and they're distributed across um, uh, Guangdong and also uh, Fujian and also uh, uh, Jiangxi. So a famous Hakka person would be like Li Huang Yu, a uh, Singapore premier, uh, ex-premier. He is a Hakka person. And so Hakka, Hakka people, in general, they're Hak. So they are, they are a guest. They don't usually get much land. So a lot of the times, if you look, if you actually go, go travel to um, 
下、uh, to、uh, Fujian, you see these huge mud cast castles, and basically it's the Hakas all living there, away from the、um, from the、uh, you would say the original people. And so Hong is a Hakka person, and he was born in、uh, a place called Huaxian, which is now part、uh, part of Canton. It's it's within Guangzhou, and he is、uh, the fourth of、uh, the, the 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 youngest of four children. His 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 parents are illiterate. Basically, they're just very poor farmers.、Um, he, he has he had two older brothers who were、uh, who are illiterate as well, and then an older sister illiterate as well. But he was the the quote unquote the smartest one in the family, and you know in ancient、um, in ancient China or be,、uh, be, in like the imperial China, the, pretty much the only way to get ahead in life is to do well in the public examination system, the imperial、uh, system. So that you can become an official, and from the official, there, there, there's phrases. For example,、um, once you、uh, you study and then you get your title, the your scholarly title, and your family will be glorified. So this really happened from the Tang Dynasty, from the seventh、uh, seventh、uh, century onwards, and by the Qing Dynasty in the eighteen fifth, but by eighteen、uh, by by nineteenth century, it's very solidified, and so Hong. The smartest of the of the four kids would, would had a lot of expectations that I'm sure that most Hong Kong kids know how it feels to do well, and、um, and, and public examination system goes like this. It's、uh, it's basically three big levels.、Uh, first one is、uh, levels one A and B. It's your first in your let's say within your village area. Let's say let's say for example Hong Kong, you live in Sha Tin, so you first go past the Sha Tin exam. And then you do the Hong Kong exam. So Hong Kong, let's say, is provincial. And say after Hong Kong, so after your main province, Guangdong, and then it would be and so your city, and then your province, and then the national. Once you go through all three, you then become what is called the Jin Shi, which is a, a scholar. And then you get、uh, then you get distributed to different places to become、uh, officials.、And、that's pretty much the only way to get ahead. Or you're a Manchurian aristocrat. So Hong did that, and when he was very young, he 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 would go. He would he would actually he would do very well in his own area in Huaxian. He would do very well, but every single time he goes to he he would go to the、um, the, the the city level Guangdong, he、uh, Guangzhou he would fail, and Guangzhou was a very you know very populous、uh, and very prosperous place. So it's very difficult to go past that. Because of the competition, or because of competition. Okay. Right? He was、so、just up against really smart people. people who yeah. Were, yeah, yeah. So he first he took he took his first exam. He he failed. The second time he failed again. The third time he failed again. And this is this is from fifteen to thirty. He kept on failing three times. And、um, is there sort of a three strikes you're out type of you, thing, or can you take it as long? You can as take it as many times as, as you want. There was one the history. There was one guy who eventually made it all the way up. By the time he was ninety. So actually, when you think about it, it's a very good im, im,、uh, the imperial、uh, system is actually a very good way to prevent a lot of people from rebelling against the system because everybody's too busy studying, and so nobody would think about rebelling. Yeah, and you basically, I mean, what, to to pass or to do well, you it's it's about if I'm not mistaken, memorizing a lot of Confucian classics. Yes, and it's a tremendous、yes. amount of material that you have to absorb. Yes, and and, and the material is all about one thing: loyalty. Right, so so it doesn't say、so, yeah yeah yeah. So it,、uh, but filial piety is below uh, uh, piety to the emperor,、okay. right? So loyalty to the emperor is above. Zhong right. xiao, right? Zhong is loyalty to the emperor. Xiao is honoring your parents. Zhong xiao, you nobody says xiao zhong. It's zhong xiao, right? So so it's so you've got armies, and and then by the third time, and it's it's very sad for Hong because he always went past the Huaxian with flying colors. So let's say you always failed at the first level. That's relatively better than he did really well in one A, but he always failed in one B. So three times, the third time he went insane. He he said he 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 was he was completely distraught. He couldn't even walk. So he actually got two people to lift him back home in a chair, and for twenty six days he had a huge fever. Like 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 like, and then and then actually his family actually locked him in. Because everybody thought that he was going, he's going crazy. Because he, he, he like he, he would,、uh, he would mumble things. He, he in, in like a state of like neurosis. And during that time, he had a dream, 
He had a dream that he saw an old man in a black robe, and he is God. And he gave him a sword, and he said, "There are a lot of evil people in China. Take this sword and kill them, and and build my kingdom."